got Bibles, I invite you to turn to the very first book of the Bible. We call it Genesis, and that's what it's all about, the beginnings of everything. And we're going to start a new book study in this. If you're new with us this morning, maybe watching online, someone invited you. Um, we are a church that teaches God's Word. We believe in the power of God's Word to change lives as the Holy Spirit shines light on it. And so we're uh, starting this book study, and I'm going to be honest with you, um, I'm, I'm pretty hesitant. There's so much whenever you start looking at Genesis. Now, not when we get to chapter 12 in the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, historical narrative, awesome stuff, but the first 11 chapters, creation, the fall, the flood, and then the Tower of Babel, and the confusion of languages... Um, There's a whole lot of stuff that's in here. And, uh, you know, I have been studying furiously over the last several months, really, um, reading, watching videos, looking at books. Um, I even went back and I read that article in Time Magazine. Those of you that are older um, might remember that in April 8th, 1966, that Time Magazine article that said or asked, Is God dead? How many of you remember that article? Yeah, well, I I went back and I read that again, and man, I watched Ken Ham, and I watched um, Bill Nye, the the goofball guy. Um, He's actually the science guy, is what he calls himself. I watched that whole debate. How many of you remember that debate back in 2014? Um, lots Lots of good stuff out there, but as we look at this, we're going to start from the beginning, and I'm going to, as we go along, We're going to be able to talk about a lot of things regarding this, but let's read at least the first two verses together because it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Goes on, Moses does, to say, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the of the water, waters. Now, let me start with the limitations of this study, all right? Because this is a Sunday morning study. This is not a Wednesday evening midweek service. This is not a Sunday evening midweek. This is not a class. And there are a whole lot of things that people, when it comes to the origins of mankind and the origins of the world, there's a whole lot of things that people want to be covered, but I'm going to tell you this up front. You probably already know this. I'm no scientist, okay? I'm not a philosophical scientist. I'm not a natural scientist. I'm a scientist in no way. I got my bachelor's in history from Washington State University. I did a master's in divinity uh, at Multnomah Seminary, and then I've been a pastor for almost 30 years, a scientist that does not make me. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to look a lot of things that the Bible says about creation. Um, Some of the stuff you might be interested in, some of the stuff you might not be interested in, and so I want to be careful about how deep we go. I won't be able to cover everything about evolution and creation. There are a lot of things that you could go into, like the fossil records, carbon dating, geological layers. We could look at natural selection, radioactive decay, tectonic plates, you know, and we will, as we go over the course of this study, especially in the first several weeks, I do want to confront some of those things, and I want to be able to talk about some of those things, but here's what I want to say in the very beginning, because this is what the Bible says. Genesis is the declaration that God created the universe, amen? In the beginning... God. And that is a statement that the Bible makes. And here's what I want to say about creation, uh, about evolution versus creation. Either you believe Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, either you believe that or you don't. Either you hold to that reality, and I'm going to say that whether or not you believe the veracity of that very first verse in the Bible really does, to a large degree, change how you see the entire rest of the Bible. Changes how you see you and why you're here on this earth. 
It, it changes how you see your purpose. It changes whether or not you see and believe in sin. Because the Bible will show us in these first three chapters where sin came from, where our sin problem came from. And I know this is something that people struggle with, having conversations with people. I just read about a conversation that an individual had. He went away to college, and as he came back for um, summer break, of course, he and his friends all wanted to get together and share their different stories about their different universities, their professors, their classes. And as they sat down in a very casual place, talking about their experiences, this guy, it says he wanted to share the fact that he came to know Jesus at his first year of college, not at a Christian college, at a secular university, but he wanted to share with his friends, his close friends, not only what happened in his first year class-wise and study-wise, but also, more importantly for him, what happened to him regarding faith. He, he gave his life to Christ, and he was so ecstatic to share with his friends. And as he laid out his gospel presentation, having thought about it pretty closely, he laid out this gospel presentation to his friends, expecting and thinking and hoping that when he was done, his friends would, of course, want to say, tell us more. What do we need to do? But one of the people that he really liked more than some of the other ones, very sharp gal, um, wealthy, come from a good family. He thought for sure she would be at least intrigued, and instead, what she asked him really startled him because what she said to him is, why do I need to be saved? What do I need to be saved from? And you know, I've had that same experience. I, I, I got accepted the Lord halfway through my bachelor's in history. My life changed, and I shared the same thing with my friends. And I've heard that question over and over and over. What do I need to be saved from? Now, what do you say when someone asks why you're saved? What are you saved from? I think in the beginning we say we're saved from our sins, right? But what does that matter? What does sin require? What is really being saved? Because before sin... Before Revelation, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of man, you have in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but even more so you have in the beginning God. And if you ask what you need to be saved from, it goes back to the fact that the God who created this world, the God who created you and me, is the God that is going to judge this world for our sin and for our mistakes. Is he not? Is that not what the Bible declares? For the wages of sin is death. But when you conveniently erase God from the equation, when you conveniently take God out of the, out of the whole kit and caboodle, the whole beginning and you replace God with evolution, which is really replacing God with man, and what man declares and decrees and cries is paramount, you don't have a judge that you have to answer to for your apparent mistakes and even what we Christians call sin. You don't have a judge. You don't have a final judgment you don't have anything that you need to be saved from if there is no holy and perfect and righteous God that loved this world enough because of our sin, sent his son to this earth to die on the cross, to take our place, and to take all of his, God's wrath, all of God's judgment, all of God's condemnation that would have fallen on us because of our sin, because in the beginning, God, all of that was taken by Jesus Christ. What do you need to be saved from? You need to be saved from the righteous and holy wrath of a perfect God. 
It's so important in our secular education. If you're a junior high, high school, even college student sitting in here today, the things that you're going to hear us talk about over the next several weeks, man, these are going to be so far different than what you're going to be taught. Unless you go to a Christian high school or a Christian college, what you're going to hear is evolution, evolution, evolution. And in fact, if you're an adult here this morning... You know that that is something that the world completely has bought. Hook, line, and fisherman, sinker. That's how far this world has decided to de-God God, if that were even a possibility. To un-God God. Now, here's what evolution, ultimately, if you stop and think about it, evolution, which is the theory of natural science, of cause and effect... Evolution, if you boil it down, teaches this. Nobody times nothing equals what? Now, how big, I don't have to be a mathematician, nor do you, but if we really look at this and say nobody times nothing equals everything we see. Now, just from a matter perspective, and I'm not going to go deep today into this stuff. We will look at some of this stuff. But even from a matter perspective, if, if we didn't have a soul, if we didn't have a consciousness, if we didn't have a will, and if we didn't have reason, evolution has no way in any capacity to account for where those things came from. Just from a sheer matter perspective, DNA, genetics... There, there's so many faults when it comes to evolution. And again, I'm no scientist... But I have been reading voraciously because I don't want to stand here and speak untruths. I want to stand here and I want to share at least as far as I can why it is that creationism, as I'm going to teach, is really the only acceptance we have for how everything we see came to be. God's creation. And you know, hear me when I say this, the Bible presents God as the creator of the universe without question. It does, the Bible, it does not teach or show theistic evolution. And sometimes Christians will capitulate because evolution and because science and because scientists have asserted their will to such a degree that to say that you're a rational thinking person and to think that in the beginning God, that has been disparaged so much that people, especially in the scientific community, they are ashamed or at least embarrassed or at least private about their beliefs if they say God created. They can't even share that. They, they, will, they will be so far marginalized in the scientific community because of this theory called evolution. It does, the Bible, not present theistic evolution, which is the idea that God started everything and then backed away and everything that we see was created through evolution after he started it. That is theistic evolution in its simplest sense. Um, some people want to talk about progressive creationism. And I'll give you, when we get there, I'll give you a certain degree that the Bible can more so talk about progressive evolution, or excuse me, creationism. And progressive creationism teaches essentially that the days that the Bible talks about, the Yah, which is a day, actually is more than just a day, a 24-hour day. They actually would say that it's, it's a, a season or it's an epic. It's a time. It, it, it's something longer than a day, which will account for the older earth or the apparent thing that we see as the older earth, right? I mean, there are so many things that you can get to, but in the end, folks, what I want to say is evolution in and of itself <laughs> is a complete lie of the enemy. The Bible presents God creating the world. And as far as we can tell in chapters 1 and 2, creating the world in six 24-hour days and then resting on the seventh day. And how you see that, if you choose to accept the Bible in the beginning, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, then the rest of Scripture, as far as my opinion is, will make sense. We can't cut that out and then try and hold to the rest of Scripture. Are you with me? 
2 Peter 3 declares that at the end, the very same God who created ex nihilo, the very same God that created with the word of his mouth, he will destroy this world with the word of his mouth as well. You can read 2 Peter 3 on your own. So if the God of this world can destroy creation with the word of his mouth, why could he not create this world with the word of his mouth? Now, let's get to the text because I'm not going to go greatly into the different models of creationism or even evolution this morning. I want to save that for next week. But I want to look at the text 32 times in this chapter. Chapter 1, the Hebrew name for God is Elohim, which is a plural noun, helping many believe or see the hint of the Trinity. And in Scripture, creation is attributed to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Uh, We see in John chapter 1, in the beginning, right, the Word was with God and the Word was He was with God in the beginning, the word logos. We see that John was saying Jesus was there in the very beginning. Colossians teaches that nothing that is made has been made without Jesus. And so we understand that Elohim means the Trinity. And when it comes to Genesis and the other books of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Um, we understand that Moses wrote those books, yeah? And and people don't have much of a problem saying that Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy because Moses was there, at least in terms of um, the things that happened. But when it comes to Genesis, people have a hard time. Now, why did Moses write the Pentateuch in the first place? And when did he write these first five books? He wrote Pentateuch to reorient and reposition the people of God after 430 years of slavery. Where? In Egypt, right? They they were discombobulated. They, They were all over the place. They were separated. They were divided. They had lost and forgotten so much of their heritage, so much of their purpose as a people. Many of them, I'm sure, after 430 years of slavery in Egypt, questioned where God even was. And so Moses wrote these books to remind them of their identity. They are the people of God, chosen by God. He wrote these books to remind them of their purpose. And their purpose, remember, was to represent God to the world at large. That's what Israel was supposed to do. Now, I know 40 years in the wilderness... And then in 1400 B.C., he began to write these five books. Exodus through Deuteronomy, as I said, are easy to accept, but people struggle with Genesis because Moses, guess what? He wasn't there, was he? Moses wasn't there in the beginning. Moses wasn't there when the fall happened. Moses wasn't there when the flood took place. He didn't know Noah personally. There's a lot of people that question, so how did Moses come to understand what went so many years before him, before he came on the scene? Some would say oral tradition, and I think that applies because the Hebrews were very much an oral tradition people. But I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that even some of these stories would have and could have been passed down. They they could have been uh, talked about and shared And then they could have been passed down because that's what the Israelites did in so many places and at so many times, didn't they? But don't lose sight of inspiration either, right? Did God meet with Moses on Mount Sinai to give him the ten what? Now, God spoke directly to Moses. And on Mount Sinai, that wasn't the first time that God spoke directly to Moses, We know that God spoke to Moses when he was out in the wilderness for 40 years, and he spoke to him through a burning what? So God and Moses had a bit of a unique relationship. God called Moses to set my people free. God told Moses over and over, and his brother Aaron, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to do this, and I want you to do this. They had a very unique relationship, 
And if God wanted to create or to communicate to Moses how everything went down in the beginning, is our God big enough to be able to create or to communicate whatever he wants his people to know? Of course. That, that, that's like easy for him. He, he wrote on tablets for Moses the Ten Commandments, Genesis or Exodus chapter 20, right? He, he gave him those things. And so you could have oral tradition. You could have inspiration. And you know, Genesis contains... Uh, all of the things that God wanted his people to know. And when it comes to the biblical creation account, there are critics that contend that what Moses wrote was a copy of other Mesopotamian creation accounts. If you're a student of the Bible and you like to look at these things, there is something called the tale of Adapa. That, that's a creation account outside of um, what it is that Moses talks about. There is the Gilgamesh epic. You can study these on your own. I'll have it in my notes. There is the epic of Atrahasis, written 1600 B.C., before Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And the epic of Atrahasis tells of a lower deity who became tired of his work and he rebelled. And they created the human race to do their work for them. That's what the epic talks about. Or you have the Enuma Elish, which is a much later Babylonian work, and it begins with the divine spirit and with the primeval chaos. But its main purpose, this epic, was to glorify the chief Babylonian god Marduk, who defeats the watery chaos monster Tamat. Light emanates from the gods and the the firmament, the dry land, luminaries, and eventually their epic says humankind is created. And then the gods, they rest, and the gods, they celebrate. Now, despite some similarities, I want you to know how very different from the Mesopotamian myths and the Babylonian myths the creation account found in Genesis really is. Very different. Gordon Wenham writes, the author of Genesis 1 shows that he was aware of other cosmologies. And he says that he wrote, the author of Genesis, Moses, not in dependence on these other tales of cosmology, so much as in deliberate rejection of what it is they taught. And you know, sinful man has always tried to rewrite truths in his own making. Wouldn't you agree? Sinful man has always tried to make for his own purposes. That's even what evolution, as I'll talk about, really does. Listen to the differences if you're into these tales and thinking that Moses just copied some of what he heard. With the Enema Elish myth, there are many gods, and Genesis proclaims one God. Whereas in the Babylonian stories, the divine spirit and cosmic matter exists side by side from eternity... Genesis proclaims God's majestic distinction from everything else which he creates, right? God is omnipotent, omnipresent. He is omniscient. God is self-sufficient, self-existent, self-sustaining. I want to do one week on the character of God and all that Genesis provides us in terms of who God is. Everything else he creates is distinct from him. Whereas in Near Eastern mythology, the sun, moon, stars, and sea monsters are seen as powerful gods, Genesis tells us that they are merely a part of creation. And in the Mesopotamian myths, light emanates from the gods. In the Genesis narrative, God creates light by the power of his word. In Genesis, God is the majestic creator of all who has life-giving power in man. Man is not just there to do the bidding of the gods, but creation of human life is, as we'll look at next week, the high point of God's creation and his desire to have a relationship with his creation. Now, I want you to see verse 3 that we're going to look at now. To the end of this chapter, detail God's creative work. Uh, if you've ever read Genesis, it's quite complex in how it presents God's creation, and it details for us God's creative work. And when it comes to these six days of creation, there is a simple pattern 
that emerges of God's creative power. I want you to see this over and over. First, God forms, and then God fills. First, he will form, and then he will fill what he forms. Three distinct entities or spaces he forms. He forms the expanse of the sky, he will form land, and he will form the waters or the seas. And then after he forms each one of these entities, he will fill them with each element as he saw fit. He creates the expanse of the sky and then fills them with the great lights, right? The sun, the moon, the stars, and he fills the sky with what the Bible says are winged birds. God said, let the dry ground land appear and fills it with animals and mankind. I'm looking at this before, and then we'll read how it goes down. God said, let the water, the seas, under the sky be gathered to one place, and then he fills it with all living creatures. He forms, and then he fills. Let's look at day one. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. We read, then God said, first we see God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. In other words, it was in chaos and it had no living thing. And darkness was over or on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then we pick it up, then God said, on day one, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God, here it is, divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, some people will look and say, where did this light come from, right? If the luminaries hadn't been created yet, the sun, moon, stars, they, they have not been created yet, so where did this light come from? But I want you to remember what the rest of Scripture will tell us about our God. God is light, is he not? You look at Revelation, and when John saw the Son of God, he saw him as what? Beautiful light. In fact, Psalm 104 Verse 2 tells us, who, covers your, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, and who, speaking of God, stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Habakkuk 3, verses 3 and 4 said, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Stop and think about it, which is Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise, His brightness was like the light he had rays flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. Revelation 22.5 says, There will be no more night. They will not need the need for a lamp nor light of the sun. They won't be needed, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. In the Revelation account, when the new heavens and the new earth come, guess what, folks? There won't be a sun, moon, and stars any longer. There will just be the light that comes from our God. Throughout Scripture, light is a common theme. Light is associated with Jesus. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Light is associated with the Word of God. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Light is associated with you and I, God's people. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once darkness, you and I, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Matthew 5, 14 says, you, speaking of us, are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Light is also associated with God's blessings. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the just or the righteous is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Light is all over in Scripture, and it's the first thing 
that God creates in darkness is the exact, it is the antithesis of light in Scripture. Darkness is associated with Satan, with sin, with death, with spiritual ignorance, and even divine judgment. John 3 says this, and this is the condemnation or the judgment, Jesus says, that the light has come into the world, speaking of himself, and men, mankind, loved what? Darkness rather than light, because their deeds, the Bible says, were evil. Everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done <laughs> They have been done in God. And so God separates the light from the darkness because, as I said, they are the antithesis of one another. And, you know, one of the most common things of creation that we're going to see is separation. And it starts from the very beginning. The, the scriptures will show us the separation that happens. Um, God separated the light from the darkness, right? He separates day from night. He will separate the waters above from the waters beneath, and he will separate the land from the waters, and this then will carry, this separation motif will carry over into the rest of God's word because Israel was to be a nation separated from those around it. The church, you and I, are to be separate from this world, in this world, but not of this world, and you know what? The unity of God's word and the continuity of God's word proclaims all of this separation. As God's people, we are to walk in the light. John says in 1 John 1, what communion has light with darkness? We're to be separated. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 to us believers, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness. Now look at the theme of separation as it continues. Day two, here's what we read. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. And then he goes on, Moses writes, day three, he says in Genesis 1 verse 9, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. I want to look at this entire creation, at least in terms of the first five days. I want to look at this collectively, and I want you to remember the separation and the forming and the filling. Okay? And we'll be able to dive in deeper. He says on day four, or this is still day three, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. Let me ask you a question. When God created the, the Garden of Eden for Adam, did he start with the genesis of a tree in the ground as a seed, and then wait for Adam Wait for those trees to develop and grow. Wait for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to grow. Or did God create that garden with all of its bounty, all of its beauty, all of its vegeta vegetation, did he create it like that? I, I tend to believe that he did. Now, this is going to go into some people believing that if this is an old earth, but yet God created it, or it looks like an old earth, but God created it in six 24-hour days, then why did God create an apparent vision of or example of the creation that was older than it really is? 
And you know what? This is a valid question. Because for all apparent purposes, the world does appear to be quite old, right? We have stars that are billions of light years away, do we not? And so people look and say, how in the world did that happen? But you know, if God wanted to create um, Adam as a grown man, was that falsifying the creation account? Was that in some way presenting something that didn't happen? Did Adam have a, people like to talk about this, Believe it or not, scientists even like to talk about this. Did Adam have a belly button? Did he create him with a belly button? Because we know that he didn't have a mom and an umbilical cord. So did Adam have that? How did God create these things? And I want to admit to you, there are some complexities of creation that we don't know the answer to. I have been reading well well-educated academics and scientists and PhDs in, in the realms of sciences and the realms of philosophical science, natural science. Uh, I've been reading more than I even want to talk about. I said to my wife, I am so overwhelmed with this stuff, I have no idea how I'm going to get through this in three hours every Sunday. <laughs> I have to condense and th synthesize all of this stuff, not only into a timely matter, but also a matter that's not going to want people to go... Oh boy, do we care about any of this? And I, I grant you, some of you do and some of you don't. I grant you, some of you do and some of you don't care about all these complexities. And so as best as I can, I pray, Lord, give me the wisdom to know what to share, what's valid, and, and what people can read and study on their own. But you know, God creates all this stuff. Let the earth bring forth grass. Does that mean it was boom grass? Or does that mean the seeds of the grass and suddenly it started to grow? Does that, that mean the tree that started was started as, a, as just a tiny seed in the ground? Or did God say, let there be vegetation? The herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit. Let there be a fruit tree. Boom, fruit tree. Well, that's disingenuous. What about the time that it took? How many rings are in that fruit tree? Because the rings in that fruit tree denote how many years old that fruit tree is. If that fruit tree is 50 feet tall or 40 feet or 30 feet tall and it's got 600 rings or 400 rings or 200 rings, well, then that's disingenuous. God's giving us something that really what wasn't true. He's lying to us. This is God, men and women. He can do what he wants and there is no lie in God. And if he wanted to create a garden in all of its beauty and all of its complexity and all of its vegetation, right then and there for Adam and Eve, then God has the capacity, of course, but also the will to be able to do that. And we, as his creation, cannot question our God. Amen. Now, stars, same thing. Those are so far away. That means it took that many years, billions of years. If God wanted to create the luminaries just like that for the expanse and the creative nature that he has, then God can do that. Amen? Amen. And I am not here to question him, and I'm going to say this as well. No scientist is here to question our God. They do, and they will. And, and as they do, they actually eradicate God. They un-God God. They de-God God if that is even a reality. But it is as far as they're concerned because once they de-God God or un-God God, then suddenly they're God and they don't answer to a God. There is no judgment. There is no answering for our sin. There is no purpose. There is no eternity. I mean, I, I don't want to jump ahead, but I do, but I don't. There are so many things about all of this, but let's continue at least our story because I'm almost out of time. And the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind God created, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass. Six 24-hour days. The herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. They all have their own genetic DNA. Each thing has its own genetic DNA. And God saw that it was good. Day three. Now, Oh, let me just say, but so the evening and the morning were the third day. Now we get to day four. Notice the forming and then the filling. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, sun, moon, stars, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Here's another thing. Um, people will say, well, if the sun, the moon, and the stars weren't even created until day four, then how do we really have four 24-hour days because they're related to the sun, the moon? our cycle is, how that whole thing works. Again, people want to, you know, can God make a rock big enough that he can't move? 
Oh, you got him. You got him. There is no God. Can God make a rock big enough that he can't move? Yes. Well, then he's not God. No. Well, then what about how he creates? Folks, God tells us what he wanted us to know. And he goes on, and let them, the luminaries, be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And then God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, the sun and the moon. He made the stars also. What a statement. He made the stars also. You know, I, I read one book specifically about stars. And, I, you know, I had to like, it blew my mind to, to think about the complexity of the stars. The galaxy, the Milky Way, our galaxy, our sun, everything around that, but yet everything and our galaxy alone, and there are so many more galaxies, it, it starts to really just kind of remind me of eternity. You ever stop and think about eternity? Start to think about it, there's no end, and you just, it starts to really wig you out a little bit. At least it does me. Maybe not you, but me it does. I'm like, when's it going to end? Because everything we know ends, but eternity never ends. It just keeps, but then, no, no. It starts to get a little funky, but that's what God wants us to know. And even the stars, but yet all God told Moses to write, because it was inspired of the Holy Spirit, all scripture is, he made the stars also. Wow, the complexity and yet the simple statement. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And those of us that live in Denver and the surrounding areas we're surprised when we even see the stars, but go up into the mountains and you're just absolutely blown away by the complexity of God's creation. Amen? It is incredible. And to rule over the day and over the night, these luminaries, and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And then we come to day five, the last we'll look at. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Just like that. Boom. He formed it, and then he fills the waters with an abundance of creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. How old were the birds? How many more years did they have left to live? Well, you say, well, there was no death at this time. They were going to live forever along with God's creation. You know what? <laughs> so God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves. Whale, boom. There's Jonah's predator, right? Fish, barracuda, salmon, boom, boom, boom. He just starts creating these amazing, you know, you fishermen love it. Oh, yeah, sea bass. Big mouth, small mouth, right? Sturgeon, barracuda, there they all are. He creates them with which the waters abounded in all of its glory according, he says, to their kind. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. What I want you to see is God's creation wasn't haphazard. God's creation wasn't chaotic, but it was full of order. And God's creation was full of design. He first forms it, and then he fills what he formed. The environment, the fruitful environment that he gave us and created was for the greatest of his creation in everything we just read. The first five days leads up to what we read next week in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. All of the separation and all of the sustenance were designed for what he creates next and what the Bible tells us he creates last. Mankind made in his image, you and me. Lord, I pray as we look